to all folks throughout the state th th that we support. We will, we will create a clear signal of facts and resources that stands out from the overwhelming noise of the social media, emails, and the 24-hour news outlets. Today's information and resources around the topics of individual and family rights. Next week, our goal is to have more updates from questions and, and information for, for people that, that we may need. So before we go any further, I would love to start out with one of our uh, uh, check-ins of who is on the call. So that poll should be popping up in just a few minutes. Fantastic. So I'll go through the poll so we can all uh, get a sense. Uh, the, the first one is individuals with disabilities, family members of individuals with disabilities, DBHDD, GVRA, DCH, DPH, Georgia DOE, policymakers and staff, and service providers and other. So I'm gonna give you all a few minutes to work on that poll, but but I just wanna uh, uh, reiterate that the uh, 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 the Georgia Developmental Disability Network is comprised of leaders throughout Georgia's disability network developmental disabilities and, and if you re refer back to your reminder email that will have a list of all of our uh, up updated partners and, and that are working with us also I want to I want to uh, do a special welcome to the uniting uniting for change advocates we're glad that you are here so I'm going to turn it over to Susanna for some housekeeping information. All right, thank you, Charlie. Um, I just want to remind everyone that we do have um, ASL captioning and our ASL interpretation and closed captioning. Um, and just a quick reminder, so it's on the screen, but if you need ASL interpreters, our two interpreters are here and um, in front of their name is ASL and you can hover over their video um, when they are the ones that are live cat or live interpreting and you can click on the three white dots in the blue box and say um, and pen the video so you can have them front and center on your videos and there's um, a closed captioning box that you can appear at the um, you can click on at the bottom or you can um, click on it to have a live transcript typed up as well. And there's more information on the document that was emailed to you and on the screen right now. All right, thank, thank you, Susanna. So now we're gonna go over the ground rules for today. Uh, like like we've been mentioning, everyone will be starting off mute for now. Uh, we have an option for you to raise your hand and to be acknowledged through the computer and through uh, 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 the phone. Uh, please stay muted. Unmute yourself if you would like to speak, and Susanna will call on you uh, by by your phone number and you can also press nine on your phone to raise your hand. You can type uh, questions in the chat box or, or the question and answer box and someone from our team will read them. Please keep questions and, and responses to 30 seconds or less. Uh, one person to speak at a time. I know there's a lot of uh, people that have questions, but it, if your question doesn't get answered yet, 
we will be able to go back to it uh, in the future. Uh, we, we will be using your emails to share information about this meeting and further meetings, as well as information and resources. Our email address for, for, for anything COVID-19 related is gaddcovid19 at gmail.com. If you are if you are speaking about yourself, that's more that that's great. You are more than welcome to share, but please be mindful about personal health information. Please raise your virtual hand and, and wait to be called on, uh, so we'll be able to keep the peace in theory. Uh, we we will also be recording this, and the link will be available to share starting tomorrow and we will be sending that out as well. We'll be collecting information and resources and questions and answers in a public Google Docs, and we will be able to have a shareable link for uh, in an email for everyone uh, by tomorrow. Again, please, please know that we are communicating the best answers we can, we can to the best knowledge and with the best intent that we have. While we, not, we may not be able to answer a lot of these questions on this call, please do keep putting them in the chat box. We keep looking at answers and, and save time and the agenda every other week to respond to questions every other week. So with that, I'm, I'm, excited, to I'm excited to pass it on and and get this started. Mark, are you ready? Thanks, Charlie. This is Mark Crenshaw. Uh, looks like we have uh, about 152 people on the call. Um, so that's amazing. Uh, just uh, thrilled with how, um, with ha the way that uh, we keep coming together to share information and, and um, ideas on these calls. Um, just wanted to make you aware as I began of uh, a, a web link with some resources, uh, with lots of resources related to um, COVID-19 and people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I am gonna paste that, the link to that um, in the chat right now so that you have access to it. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a Google Drive folder um, with um, lots of public facing resources for us to share. Um, um, and um, it's a sort of group curated resource. So as, as folks from the community reach out to us with, with ideas and, and information and resources, um, we wanna be able to share it with you um, the Google Drive folder is actually on your screen now, so you have um, an idea of what that looks like. Wanted to give a special shout out to Hillary Hibben, who's uh, been one of the organizers of, of that folder. Um, there are lots and lots of resources in there now, um, but um, we're tr doing our best to try to keep them um, to try to keep them organized in a way that's helpful to you guys. Um, just wanted to point out a couple of additional resources or a couple of specific resources that are in that folder. There is a COVID-19 medical glossary um, in, in the folder um, that I want to call your attention to, as well as a list of acronyms. Um, so there, there's a resource folder with a list of acronyms that you might hear on this call. We don't assume that everyone sort of uses the same um, uh, acronyms and language to talk about the issues on these calls all the time. So we wanted to uh, do our best to make sure that that we were um, spelling out what those acronyms mean and how they're being used in these calls. So um, want to call your uh, attention to that. And now um, I think it's my task to introduce uh, John Anderson, who's the Chief Deputy Division Director for DFACS, who is going to share with us for about three or four minutes. John, are you yes, on the call? Yes, thank you. I'm, 
I am. I'm here. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yep. I certainly can. And I'll, Go ahead. I'll turn my I'll turn my screen on so you can see me uh, Absolutely. as well. So we want to talk you know, to talk about a couple of things that we're working on uh, through the the pandemic um, options that we've got available to us from the Food and Nutrition Services who oversee oversees the SNAP program. So one of the questions that we've been getting quite a bit lately is is are we going to be able to have the ability for SNAP customers to use their benefits online? through companies like Amazon, Walmart, and I'm happy to report that we have um, we have submitted our application to the Food and Nutrition Services at the federal level on Friday to, to begin that process, to get approval for that process. And once our, our federal partner approves our plan, we'll be able to get that uh, implemented within seven to eight weeks. So if they approve it this week, it'll be by the end of May that our SNAP customers will be able to order food online and get uh, home delivery with that. Um, the the challenge that I want to make sure that everybody understands is that that FNS uh, federal partners doesn't allow delivery fees or tipping as part of what can be purchased through the the EBT cards. So families would still need to make decisions on how they want to want to handle those types of fees because they're not currently allowed uh, for for those types of um, charges. So that's one thing we're really excited about that. That's something that um, I think that we're we're coming up into the 20th century or the 21st century. I think that's what we're in right now to to allow people to, to participate in that program. And uh, one of the other things that we've done, I think somebody may have heard uh, on this as well, is we've, we've also been issuing what's called pandemic SNAP benefits, which are, or we call them PSNAP for short, which uh, allows states to apply with the federal government to give people the maximum amount of their household size for SNAP benefit. So if you have somebody that uh, is receiving, let's just say, $20 and, and a month, then their maximum benefit uh, amount would be $100, for example, but their income brings them down to the $20 amount, we can now supplement that extra $80 in a PSNAP uh, benefit, which we're issuing at the end of each month. So that issuance started on Saturday, and it's every other day. Until um, until the end of the month, and we'll have all those benefits out to people. So that's been a huge um, a huge help, I think, to Georgians because the the uh, to give you an idea how big this is is that in in March the benefit amount that we put out just for PSNAP was about 65 million dollars uh, for families across the state, and then for the April benefits that we're releasing is is about 71 million dollars. So you can see that that's lots of money we're putting in the hands of individuals. Um, that are able to let them um, go out and purchase foods and keep them in the home so they can they can uh, make their food dollars go a little bit further along. Uh, some of the other questions that we have, and I'll cover one more, is that um, we've also extended the renewal period, the recertification periods for March, April, and May. So those families that had renewals uh, that were due for, for Medicaid or SNAP or for TANA, we're all extended out another six months, and there's nothing additional that the families need to do during this time period um, to to keep their benefits going. We have also received approval in the last couple of days from the federal government to also do the same thing for June. So, so March, April, May, and June benefit renewals will not have to be completed by any family in the state. So we're really excited about that, and I think that there's some really uh, good offerings for our federal partners to to give to the state so that uh, families can can focus on their own health and their own safety. So I'll turn it back over to you, Mark. That's great. Thank you for that update, John. Um, um, and we appreciate you being on the call today to to um, to let folks know about that. Um, will you be able to stay on the call for a little bit in case there are questions in the chat box related to? I can stay on for a few more minutes. Yes, I can. Okay, thanks. We'll, we'll monitor the chat box and, and make sure we um, um, lift out any questions specifically for you. Thanks for your time this okay, afternoon. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, so the the um, sort of um, what we wanted to uh, um, address, given um, sort of where we are as a state in Georgia now on today's meeting are sort of the challenges to um, people with intellectual and, de and developmental disabilities related to um, 
the the news that there are um, industries in the state that are reopening. So um, we've asked um, and um, and made connections with a couple of um, disability advocates, John McCarty and Carmine Vera, who are going to um, share um, a couple of perspectives with us about um, about sort of their lives and and concerns with the state reopening. So I see John on the screen now. Um, John John's mic is muted. So um, John, we're ready to hear from you if you're ready to share. Thanks for being on today. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, I'm uh, Joan. I'm John's communication partner. Some of you may jo know John already. For those of you who do not, John um, communicates by spelling. And so as such, um, he's prepared a statement about how he feels affected by the governor's opening of certain businesses within the state and uh, quote unquote opening the economy. So um, with no further ado, here's what John's written. I'm not able mm -hmm. to control anything. I don't have the ability to control my body mm -hmm. hardly at all. Mm -hmm. And that means a lot of anxiety. So here we are in a situation where everyone feels anxious because things are out of their control. Take your own anxiety and multiply it by 10. And that's where I've been since the beginning of this pandemic. Now with absolutely no change in policy or plan such as widely available testing, a plan for tracing and targeted isolation and quarantine, we're, we're supposed to go back to normal? The anxiety is debilitating. I want a science-based comprehensive plan and I want it widely and clearly communicated. And that is John's statement. Thank you, John. We really appreciate you being on to share that this afternoon. Um, I think the next person um, we wanted to hear from is Carmine Vera. So Carmine, are you on the call? Maybe he's muted. It's possible. I can't find him in the participant list. Okay. Maybe we move on and if someone sees him or contacts him, we can yeah, someone, make someone, space for him. We definitely want to hear from, uh, to have an opportunity to hear from Carmine. So if um, folks who are monitoring the Zoom can let us know if he joins or let us know how to um, how to hear from him. That'd be great. So um, Mark, just, yeah, go ahead, Dana. Maybe while we wait for um, folks to see if we can find, connect with Carmine, we do have a couple questions in the chat about SNAP benefits. Awesome, go ahead. Um, so John, John apparently, John Anderson apparently has, has jumped in the chat and said he will find the SNAP maximum benefit chart so it can be posted so when John gets that to us, we'll share that with everyone. Um, that's the primary question that we had. And we had one more question for someone trying to figure out if they were already receiving the max benefit um, and how they could get in touch with their, their benefits worker. Um, so if you get the chat, if you get the chart, you can compare your, what you're receiving for your family size and know. Um, and if you still need to get in touch with your benefits worker, then maybe that's something John can hop on and let people know um, how do you have to handle communication right now. Hi, this is John. Can you all hear me again? Yes, sir. Okay, good. I didn't know if you muted everybody again, but yeah, I'll have, I'll get, I'll send out all those instructions if people have questions about that. And again, if they're not, if you're already receiving the maximum benefit amount uh, for like a household size of one, for example, the benefit amount maximum is $194. 
and for a household size of one. And if you're receiving less than that, that brings you up to that maximum amount. The only exception is if you have a, a, a previous claim. So like if you owe a twenty dollar claim that you've already already done, we don't we don't we take that as an exception. So we'd subtract out the the uh the twenty dollars from the maximum fee snap amount because we don't want you to have a claim and then and that's give you the money back and then you have to pay it back again. So that's the only two exceptions. But I'll send a chart so you can post it. Uh, and then people can look at their household size and their circumstances and see whether whether they uh, may or um, may or um, may have additional questions, I should say, from from that sign. Okay. All right. And then there was um, another question regarding someone had a renewal in March, um, but they didn't they didn't get any. They were up for renewal, renewal before March. I'm sorry, but didn't get any response um, from from DFACs and they're they're just a little bit nervous about that. Don, can you speak to that they, at all? Yeah, let me just see if I can find the question again. So they had a renewal that was that was due in March and they, they haven't heard anything back on the response. It says it was the, the renewal they were up for renewal before March, but they never heard from the government is what the quote says. Yeah, if they were submitted, if they had a renewal that was due in February or January, for example, and they and the person submitted a renewal form, then we we went ahead and completed those renewals. Those are almost all done. I've been tracking those every day. I think there was there was as of this morning there was only about 51 uh, remaining renewals uh, from February that we haven't finished, and we're continuing to work through those. Uh, but if they haven't submitted anything, you know, they can call. I mean, if they haven't received anything on those, then then they do they need to. Um, call the uh, the toll free line and, and put in their authentication information and then get information on their case. Um, if, and then also you can speak to a case manager. Or, or uh, one of the things I didn't talk about is that right now we've got a lot of extra help on our call lines right now, and the average time uh, for our callbacks uh, this week was about 28 seconds. So if you got questions, now's the time to call in because we've got a lot of extra people helping, and you don't have to spend a lot of time waiting on the phone. Um, so All right, and be um, last question I think we can get to with um, with John on the line is um, someone asked a question about the impact of stimulus payments on, I guess UI is unemployment insurance. Oh, oh sorry, the impact of stimulus and, and unemployment insurance on SNAP. There you go. On SNAP. Okay, on SNAP, uh, SNAP is, is, is counting those uh, extra federal benefits. It's part of the income budget, so that sometimes there may be people that that uh, may not be eligible for SNAP because of the extra benefits that are coming in through um, the, the federal unemployment insurance. So those are being counted as part of the income. Uh, it's, conf it's confusing because Medicaid is not counting it. It was specifically in the federal law that Medicaid is not counting it, but our system knows how to treat both of those. Uh, so it, it doesn't count it in Medicaid and it does count it in SNAP. John, we thank you so much for being on the call and helping us clarify those questions. Um, and we're grateful to, to have a little bit of your time today. You thank you all very much. And I'll follow up with the additional information that you needed. Thanks so much. And Susanna, we might have time for a poll. Um, I found Carmine first. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Great. Team Great. effort. Team Great. effort. Thank you, Joe, Sarah, for all your hard work. Um, so I've got the phone number and I'm going to unmute now. Carmine, are you there? Yes. Yay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carmine, for being on today. No problem. I'm very happy to be here. Would you, would you mind to talk about, um, Carmine, the impact of, of Georgia opening back up for you? Uh, I miss work. Yeah. Uh, I miss all the interaction. I, I miss all the interaction. I miss interacting with the uh, all the interaction with the employees and stuff like that. Yeah. It's very, and I miss riding the train at my work. It's been a really rough time for me because mm -hmm. I don't mean to be, I don't mean to be sad right now, but I am kind of sick because I'm missing work right now. I miss all my friends and I miss the food, 
uh, from work. I miss all the friendships that I, I meet every day, and it's just I I I miss every bit of my work. That's huh. that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's very hard right now. Yeah. Very very hard for me not to be able to get out and not be able to go to work, yeah. and I'm not able to do the things that I want to do right now. Yeah. So, thank you for allowing me to be a, a part of this meeting. I really, I really appreciate it. As y'all know, I'm willing to be a part of any other types of meetings that y'all have because I'm very bored. <laughs> I'm, my, I'm very bored, yeah. as y'all know, know right now. So anytime y'all need me to be on something, I'll be more than happy to. Thank you so much, Carmine. Thanks, thanks for sharing your perspective. We really appreciate your time today. There's a question for Thank Carmine you. in the chat box. Okay. Carmine, have you had a tough time with caregivers coming? No, I haven't. They've been showing up every day. That's good. They're actually the best caregivers ever, actually. Nice. Good. Thank you so much, Carmine. I, th I think, you know, it's just so important for, you know, there are almost, uh, almost 170 people on the call today. So I think it's so important for them to hear from you and from John about how this is, is uh, affecting you. They're, People saying in the in the chat, Carmine. Just so you know, I know you're on the phone, but people saying thank you for sharing. Um, I miss my friends too. Um, Joe Sarah says, "Good job, Carmine." Thank you. So, um, just as we transition um, from sort of one part of the meet, one part of the conversation to another, um, we're going to put up our second poll, um, and the poll says if you or your family member are a now comp waiver recipient how have you received information on your employment housing dsp health care rights <clears throat> and needs and so the choices are my support coordinator service providers dbhdv website or webinars Georgia Development of Disabilities Network website and webinars, other individuals with disabilities, other parents, Georgia Crisis, crisis and Access Line, other, or I do not receive now comp waiver services. So we'll wait just a few moments um, while the poll populates. Um, Looks like we have about 70 responses right now. So thank you guys for um, interacting with the poll. I think in, in response to uh, Carmine's story and John's story, Martha Haythorn says, I know how you feel. We are all in this together. So thank you, Martha. I think you're absolutely right. So it looks like we're up to about 90 participants in the poll. And the most popular way that people are receiving information, it looks like DBHDD website and webinars. Um, bunch of folks on this call don't are not receiving now in comp waiver services, which is not a surprise given uh, the state of uh, the waiting list. So thanks for that information. Um, so thank you for um, responding to the poll. 
Um, Want to move along in terms of our agenda now? We're going to um, have some uh, some um, guests talk about a few topics related to um, the governor's um, uh, directive that they're um, that the state is reopening, and um, sort of the the theme in the context of of these conversations that are coming up about um, employment rights. Um, and medical rationing and access to uh, supports in the hospital. Um, sort of the, the first theme is sort of in, in terms of employment rights, your, your employment rights do not change. Um, so just um, want to sort of talk about that. And then um, um, I, I think our first presenter, if I'm not mistaken is Adrian Williams, uh, Adrian Williams from the WIPA project at GVRA. So Adrian, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Would you mind to um, talk to us about your uh, briefly about your role at GVRA and um, and share with folks about um, about what you guys are doing? Okay, um, my name is Adrian Williams and I am with the WIPA project um, through GVRA. In Georgia, there are two WIPA projects. Um, it's us and Shepherd. And um, Shepherd handles one part of the state, we handle the rest of the state. We also do um, clients for DBHDD. Hold on one second, I need to kick out my four legged office assistant who is barking at Amazon. <laughs> Okay, um, WIPA works with individuals who receive SSI and SSDI and uh, helping them to understand the impact of work on those benefits. Under the current situation that we have with um, COVID-19, there are two additional factors that come into play. One of those being the stimulus payments that are going out and the second one being unemployment. Regarding the stimulus payment, for, and I'm gonna cover this based upon first SSI recipients and then SSDI recipients because the impact is totally different. For SSI recipients, cash benefits, typically any monies received impact the SSI check. However, the CARES Act specifically states that for the stimulus funds, Social Security will not count those monies as income or resources. It's only income in the month that you get it, and it's a resource for up to 12 months. I mean, uh, it's usually a resource, resource the next month. For this particular situation, they're not counting it. So you basically have a year to use that money before it has an impact. With that being said, now is a great time if you don't have an ABLE account to open one. Funds in an ABLE account do not count as a resource, and they're available for you to use it when you need it. So if you don't have one, I suggest you either go on to the Georgia website and do Georgia Stable or go to the ABLE National Resource Center and select an ABLE account through another state. It doesn't have to be Georgia. You pick the plan that works for you. As the client and the beneficiary, you drive the bus on that stable account. So again, take advantage of putting those monies into an ABLE account so they're there when you need them. So stimulus money does not impact SSI at all. Stimulus money also does not impact HUD because they consider that to be a temporary resource, so no impact there. Um, getting conflicting information on SNAP, we were told no impact, but we just heard that there is impact. So I'm not gonna touch that one. Let me get clarification, I'll come back to that one, okay? Unemployment benefits and, and SSI. Unemployment impacts your SSI immediately. SSI is a needs-based program. So any monies that you received earned from wages or unearned from any other source impacts SSI. With that being said, if you're eligible for F4 unemployment and you receive SSI, please apply. Let Social Security keep their $783 and you can collect your maximum SSI, and SSI, I'm sorry, UI benefit 
plus the additional $600 per week that's a part of the CARES package. So you will be better off collecting for this for as long as it lasts, collecting the money under unemployment than taking 783 from Social Security. And your Medicaid stays intact for two reasons. Medicaid benefits, there's a provision that once you don't have any money left in SSI, you go on to 1619B, which is Medicaid for working individuals. Under that provision, you can earn a little, a little over $31,000 a year you'd have to earn before your Medicaid is impacted. That's under normal circumstances. Right now and for the duration of the pandemic, Georgia, like other states, has, has accepted additional funding for Medicaid. Therefore, they cannot terminate anyone on Medicaid. So if you have it for right now, you're good. So please take advantage of being able to get that additional S unemployment monies. If you get special pay on your job because of either um, a bonus or, or, or hazard pay because you're working in the midst of the pandemic, Social Security will count those funds. So any monies you receive, you need to let Social Security know about it so that you don't end up when all of this is said and done, that you don't end up with a huge overpayment. Okay, um, let me pause there. Are there any questions regarding the impact of the funds on SSI? Dana, anything? We don't see anything in the chat box right yeah, now. Uh, somebody asked how much can I put in an ABLE account? For a year, it's a little over $12,000 from, from, um, from just regular. And if you're working, you can put, in to put an additional 15. So during this pandemic, I, I mean, unless somebody's got a really, really great job, I don't see you ex exceeding those maximums right now. So the, there is a question, but it's about SSDI. So I think you're coming to that, right? Yeah, but I wanted to make sure because the, the rules are totally different. That's why I didn't want to combine them. Right. So if you have any questions on SSI and we don't get them answered now, we'll come back to that. So let's move on to SSDI. Unlike SSDI, SS, I mean, under SSI, SSDI is based upon what you paid into the system you draw out of it or what you're drawn off of a parent or a spouse's record. So it's not impacted by how much money, by how much money you receive, i.e. the stimulus. It doesn't impact that check at all, regardless. It's never going to impact it. Um, they don't look at it as an income. They don't look at it as resources. When we talk about the unemployment side of things, they don't count that either because they're looking at that as you got it as a benefit from having worked, but you didn't do work to get that check. Like going reporting to your, your job eight to five and getting a paycheck is different than receiving unemployment for sitting at home. So un unemployment has no impact whatsoever on SSDI, okay? When we talk about special pay, when it comes to bonuses, hazard pay and things of that nature, that does, or can potentially impact SSDI because they consider that to be earnings. So you're being paid because you're working, not because you're sitting at home. And caveat to that is some companies are paying folks to sit at home. So again, if I'm getting the check, but I'm not working, they don't count it. If I'm receiving extra pay or a bonus because I'm working, it is counted and you need to let Social Security know. In either situation, you've got to tell Social Security that you are working so that they can make those adjustments. On the SSI side, so that it immediately impacts that check. From the SSDI side, are you using trial work period months? Where are you in trial work period and other things that go along with that? So again, knowing how each side is impacted and you can't, the rules, you, can, they, you don't commingle them. They're two entirely different sets of rules. And that's what our project and Shepherd is here to help you understand. Any other questions on that? Dana, are there questions in the chat that Adrian can respond yeah, to? Yeah, so there's one question that asks, can you get unemployment and the additional stimulus money if you weren't working in place of SSI and SSDI? Say that question again, Dana. Yeah, the question is, can you get unemployment and the additional stimulus money 
if you weren't working in place of SSI and SSDI. And I'll take a stab at that. You wouldn't get unemployment, but you'd get the stimulus payment that citizens got, um, but there okay. wouldn't be an unemployment benefit. Let me stop you. This is three different, you're talking about three different pots of money here. Right. Stimulus applies to everybody. It doesn't matter what your work situation was, because when they announced this, it's for people who are currently working, people who are retired, people who are disabled. Depending upon your situation will determine how much stimulus funds you're entitled to. And IRS will make that determination. That's one pot of money. It has nothing to do with either of the other two. Unemployment is totally based upon you have to have been working in order to be qualified for unemployment. So if you didn't work and you're not entitled to it, it's a mute point. Okay. If you are entitled to unemployment and you're currently drawing your SSI, your SSI payment will be reduced because of the unemployment benefit. Because SSI is needs based and it's based upon income and resources. So basically, Social Security says if you have some of your money, you need less of mine. So they're looking at this and saying you have some unemployment, so you need less SSI. Does that answer the question for the person that asked it? I'll look out to see if, if they chime back in. Adrian, we've got a ton of questions coming in on this. And so I think the, the best thing for us to do probably is to collect these questions and get them to you. And then maybe we'll do like a special um, benefits uh, SSI um, COVID FAQ because um, we've got we've got a ton. They're fast and furious in the chat right now. I kind of figured as much, and that's fine. Kate can send you guys can send them on to me, and I'll research, make sure I've got good answers, and maybe some additional links to resources that we can respond back to everybody on those questions. Will do. That's Perfect. great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, so the, the next thing we want to um, talk about um, in the context of this call, um, we have Allison Barkoff from the Center for Public Representation uh, in Washington on the call. And um, we've asked her to uh, um, spend about the next 10 minutes talking about um, the work that they're doing re related to um, making folks aware of medical rationing and some other some other related issues so allison if you're on i, th I think i saw in the chat that you are already right. her powerpoint is up thank you so much for being with us today I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for your time sure thank you and can everybody hear me okay okay awesome i see a lot of faces of people i love and some of my favorite advocates in the whole world so um so thanks for having me on and I understand GAO is going to be on after me to talk a little bit about some specific things that are happening um, in Georgia. And Kate, do, am I forwarding my slides or are you doing that? Oh, I, can I do that? I'm doing it. Okay. Susanna's doing it. Yeah, okay. Susanna's forwarding and then we uh, will make those slides available in right. the shared drive. Okay, so, um, so just to give a little bit of context and to take our brains back maybe four or five weeks you know, as, as the COVID um, crisis really started hitting the United States, as we started seeing what was happening in Europe, where there was, um, you know, a, a deluge of people going into emergency rooms and, and needing treatment, um, people in the disability community started being incredibly concerned about what might happen here in the United States. I know I don't have to tell people who are on the phone, the long history of discrimination that people with disabilities have faced in accessing healthcare, everything from a long history of forced sterilization by people with, uh, of people with disabilities to being denied um, life-saving treatments like organ transplants for people with disabilities. And then just really some basic things like people with disabilities who might be in a wheelchair not being able to access um, doctor's offices, medical tables, um, getting mammograms, doctors who um, won't use plain language and assume people with disabilities can't make decisions for themselves. So we're walking into this as a community with a, um, with a significant background and history of, of discrimination in the healthcare system. Um, Suzanne, I'm not sure if my, oh, you got it. Um, so the first thing was, 
immediately in early March, people started saying there really needs to be guidance that comes out. The federal agency that oversees civil rights laws in the healthcare context, that's the um, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights. There was a big push by Congress, disability groups to say we really need for there to be something. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is what are the federal laws that apply? Um, you know, we're, we're used to thinking about the ADA, but actually there are several. Um, and it covers really all of the healthcare entities that, that people with disabilities might interact with. So the first is Title II of the ADA, which covers public entities. So that would be public hospitals or guidance that comes out from the state. Um, Title III of the ADA covers access in private healthcare facilities. So, so again, the ADA does cover that. Um, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act prohibits disability discrimination by any recipients of federal funding and virtually any medical facility gets either Medicare or Medicaid, so it's covered by 504. And then there are anti-discrimination provisions in the Affordable Care Act called Section 1557, which includes um, prohibitions on discrimination based on disability, and that covers any kind of medical facility that is a recipient of HHS funding. Um, so we have a lot of civil rights laws that apply in this context. Because of incredible advocacy, including from many of the organizations on, the, on this uh, webinar and, and the national um, associations of y'all, um, HHS's Office of Civil Rights did put out a really important bulletin. And um, it's a really important tool for you guys to kind of have and use in your advocacy. And I want to touch on a couple of the important points that were in the bulletin. The first thing they made clear is even though we are in a pandemic, even though a national crisis um, has been declared by the president and by um, the secretary of HHS, civil rights discrimination laws remain in place. So you don't get a, you don't get a pass. Um, we still have these basic rights. The first thing um, that they said in terms of really principles is that it is illegal for um, medical facilities, for doctors, for states to deny medical care based on stereotypes, assessments about quality of life, or judgments about a person's worth based on their disability. And when we first started looking at state plans, we, we often saw things that very much tied to people's quality of life, stereotypes about what having a disability might mean, um, and so this was really important um, principle to be able to have out there and to tie our legal arguments to. Um, the second thing is that in, in disability law, the most important thing is that you have to make sure that decisions are made based on your own individual case and not about um, um, kind of perceptions that you might have based on a person's disability. So just to give an example, in some of these um, protocols, we might see, oh, we don't think people who have cystic fibrosis are, are likely to be able to recover from COVID, but it may be very different for someone who has cystic fibrosis and has not really had a history of significant health issues versus someone who is coming into the hospital with a lot of significant issues. So those individualized assessments are key. Um, next page. Um, the other thing that's really important, and I think this ties a lot to the hospital policy issues that GAO is going to be talking about next, is all of these um, healthcare facilities have to make what we call reasonable modifications, changes to their regular day-to-day -day policies to make sure people with disabilities have equal access to treatment. So for someone who may have an intellectual disability or cognitive disability or deaf or is blind, they have to provide different ways for effective communication. And that may include even having someone with the person to, to help that person communicate. For people who use um, durable medical equipment or have mobility impairments, there must be accommodations to make sure people can access um, 
They specifically talked about plain language, which I don't know if um, our good friend Liz Weintraub is on, but um, she'd be very happy for me to flag that. And then for people of limited English proficiency, also interpreters. Um, next slide. So now that we had this kind of framework in terms of thinking about um, what the law requires, a lot of state advocates started working very hard and looked at does our state have a policy in terms of if care had to be rationed, if our hospitals got overwhelmed, we don't have enough ICU beds or ventilators, how will those decisions be made? And I think for many people, they found one of two things. One, in a state like Georgia, there, there actually wasn't a crisis standards of care. So the push was, we really need to develop something because if we just leave it to the judgment of medical professionals, particularly um, knowing this long history of, of how doctors view people with disabilities that's really ripe for discrimination. The second bucket was places that looked at, oh my gosh, we have crisis standards of care that are so discriminatory. So some included, for example, completely excluding people because they had a disability. Everything from in Alabama, they said, if you have a significant intellectual disability or dementia, you are not a candidate to get a ventilator. Other places said if you had um, certain neuromuscular disabilities and needed help with activities of daily living, we're not gonna, um, we're not gonna give you a ventilator. So those are what we call categorical exclusions. Um, some really looked at what we thought in essence was about the quality of life. So, you know, making predictions about will someone with a disability live a long time after getting the ventilator? We, we know that maybe someone with Down syndrome might statistically have a lifespan of 60 years old versus someone else might have 70. But when we're looking at can someone survive COVID, will they benefit from getting a ventilator? That really is about a quality of life judgment. Or um, will you need to be on a ventilator longer than someone else? You know, there's no way to really predict that. And we saw that this was being used to really deprioritize people with disabilities and put them at the end of the line. Um, so we have filed now at this point nine complaints. Um, we filed complaints in Kansas and New York, Alabama, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, New York, um, and I'm, I'm forgetting one, um, all that have different pieces that we think really either directly discriminate against people with disabilities or end up deprioritizing people with disabilities. Um, for anyone who has ever been involved with the Office, Office of Civil Rights, and I know folks in Georgia have historically, this usually is a many months or years long process for them to resolve complaints. But given the urgency, they have moved very quickly and at this point have resolved, oh, yep, Washington State. That was the first one. Um, thanks, Stacy. Um, they have quickly resolved complaints in Alabama and Pennsylvania. Um, in Alabama, the state had to pull down their policy that excluded people with intellectual and cognitive disabilities. Um, and in Pennsylvania, they made a lot of changes to take out some of the categorical exclusions and really limit how they look at survivability. So I think as you're thinking about advocacy in, um, in Georgia and, and pushing towards next steps, these are some really important things. Um, next slide. There has been um, a lot of state level advocacy, great coalitions that have happened and often um, disability, aging, and racial justice groups have worked together and plans have really changed because of that advocacy. Some great examples are in Massachusetts and Illinois, Wisconsin, and Colorado. Um, and I have all of these materials on, uh, linked on a web page in the last slide if you um, want to look at some of the advocacy folks have been doing. In Georgia, um, very early on, the, the DDAC partners and um, a few other DD organizations sent a letter to the governor um, about a number of things, and it included asking for non-discrimination and standards of care. Um, as GAO is probably going to talk about, the good thing is um, just in the last week, Georgia did put out a very general guidance being clear that um, hospitals 
cannot discriminate based on disability. But on the other hand, just having this kind of broad restatement of what OCR has said is not as helpful as having a very specific um, standard that doctors must follow that's appealable. And I think people will probably continue on that. Um, next slide. Um, and then just to um, kind of preview what I think GAO is going to be talking about with more um, specifics about Georgia and the work that you guys are doing, in the guidance from the Office of Civil Rights, they did talk about, as I mentioned, needing to make reasonable modifications to policies when it's necessary for people to get equal access. And for many people with disabilities, um, it's critical to have either a family member or um, a direct support professional there with them to be able to help with communication, to be able to help with decision making. And as states put out kind of um, system-wide no visitor policies, there was a big push and has been across states to make clear that hospitals must have exceptions for people with disabilities who need um, family or, or support to be able to access um, just in the last two or three weeks, um, there have been some great statewide policies, and I would really push Georgia to do that rather than having to work individual hospital by hospital. Um, New York, Oregon, New Jersey, and just yesterday, Massachusetts have put out guidance from the state agencies, and there's an excellent um, policy statement from the American Academy of Developmental uh, Medicine and Dentistry and there's a petition about hospital visitor policies. Um, separate and apart from that, and it's something you should think about in your advocacy, as part of the CARES Act that was passed, that was one of the coronavirus relief bills passed about three weeks ago, there was a statutory provision that allows for DSPs, DSPs to be able to pay, be paid to support someone in the hospital. Previously, if you were on a waiver, and you were inpatient, you could get absolutely no home and community-based supports. Um, so this new provision is really important if you um, set both have a hand in hand the policy that allows visitors in as well as a way to allow for non-family support to be paid for. Um, CMS, the federal agency, is allowing states to quickly seek these authorities through emergency waivers and if Georgia already has an Appendix K, which I know you do. You can go back and amend that and actually it can be retroactive. Um, and they are gonna be putting out guidance for how states like Georgia can put this in place um, moving forward even outside of the guidance, uh, outside of the emergency. Um, the last slide is just some resources. Everything that I mentioned is on this medical rationing page. Um, all of the guidance from the federal government, all of the complaints, the state level advocacy, and we have put together a lot of resource tools as well as those hospital visitor policies. Um, so I will stop there and see if anyone has any questions for me. Thanks very much, Allison. I don't Go currently ahead. see anything in the chat, but Allison, it's it's always great for you to, to share with us um, and get us up to speed on what's going on around the country and what we might be able to use to, to push things a little bit closer to what we need in Georgia. So Yeah, I mean, I want to compliment you guys. You've done a great job. You are not one of the states, in my experience, it's the easiest to get um, civil rights statements out of your, your leadership, but um, great start with the guidance this week. And um, I think continuing to push on the hospital policies, and even if Georgia doesn't end up needing to use crisis standards of care, we don't know how long the situation is going to go on. So I think it's a important place to continue the advocacy and, and you guys always rock. Well, I appreciate that. Um, and I'm sure everyone else on the call likes the, the reminder to keep it up as well. Um, so I'm going to um, turn it over to Denise Quigley from the Georgia Advocacy Office. Um, Denise is the program director in our resource advocacy um, program and, and helps um, everyone who comes into the GAO 
um, with a question kind of get started. Um, and so she recently wrote um, a, an article um, or a blog about um, some of the questions that we've had around um, what's going on with hospitals and um, what support people might need or be able to get. So the article, the link to the article is in the blog, but I'll turn it over to Denise now. Hi, thanks, Dana. So Allison made a great re presentation regarding the legal rights and um, the importance, certainly, of advocacy. So I think the first thing I want to say to folks is to remember that your civil rights are still intact and the Americans with Disabilities Act accommodations are still available. And um, Allison touched on a lot of the legal part, which I'm very happy to have her have done that. Um, I'm going, I want to also make sure that everybody realizes your advocacy really is working. Um, we have a lot of positive things that have happened. Um, and it's important to know that not to give up. Um, so I'm going to talk, there's, there are a lot of um, really great resources. I'm not going to really go over them. There's too much information to go over, but I wanted to, um, I know Dana is going to put in the chat box some of these resources. Um, it's in, the statewide advocacy network of New York has put together um, some really great information, um, some special language for people with disabilities and supports, and that's been that's that might be a really good um, resource for you when, in fact, you find yourself in the hospital with somebody. The first thing I want to talk about is before you're in the hospital, before you have to go in the hospital, some of the things uh, that would be best for you to think about right now so that you're not scrambling. So um, it's really hard to do this. I find that when I think really hard about it, it makes it more real. So I'm not I'm just giving you advice. Uh, I do know that it's really hard when you start thinking about what it's going to look like if your loved one is in the hospital, has to go in the hospital and you're told that you have to leave. So that is reality in some experiences that some people have had. Um, we're trying really hard to make sure that these exceptions in all facilities are um, recognize and people are in fact able to have their loved ones with them in the hospital 24 7 but that's not happening right now so i'd like for people to be more prepared at this time and not have to scramble and find themselves trying to catch up and what can i do what can i do so i think the more prepared you are um the more preparation you have now um you prepare for the worst and hope for the best of course right um, so I'm going to go over some of those things um, before you go into the hospital. Some of the things you want to think about and maybe have ready would be um, all the emergency things that the emergency contact information, um, whether somebody, and I'm talking about if you have allergies or what your likes and dislikes are, um, if you're on a special diet, what kinds of things would be soothing or calming to your person. If you think of all of these things ahead of time and have them written down, then if you find that you're at the hospital with your loved one and you're told you have to leave, you can give these things to the hospital people at that time and you're not just scrambling to Think of what do you need to give people and what do people have to know about your loved one um, at that time. So um, other things that would be helpful for you to think about and have prepared now before it happens would be um, to have a picture of your loved one, of your person with a disability who is in a happy time with their family, maybe at work. Um, label the people in the photo so that um, people know when they're in the hospital, people are going to know who they are and they can talk about them and it makes the person more relatable and it's easier to get to know 
you get to know who the person is rather than this is a patient, this is a sick person. This is a person who's a loved one, who's a family member, and who unfortunately doesn't have somebody with them at, at this time. Um, so if you can, can do that, that would be helpful. You wanna make sure that you talk about the method of communication, if there are any unique qualities that somebody meet, might need to know. Um, when I talk about the method of communication, not only if they don't use words to communicate, but um, one family that I had talked about said that when their family member is very calm and or feels the need to be calm and to, that it's very soothing for them to, to moan. And some people might indicate, think that that was an indication of pain, and yet it's actually their way of trying to self-soothe themselves. So it's just important to think about just unique things about your person that you want someone to know. All the things that you would do if you were in the hospital with them that you can't do. So you want to have those kinds of things available to you um, before available to the facility um, before you you have to leave. Um, I've got a couple of links. I wanted to. I think that I, I don't know if Dana has put them up yet. Um, there's a healthcare passport that was put out um, by the Florida. You said, and there's also the New York Sunny. Um, the Stony at Stony Brook put out um, also some really good resources on COVID-19. It's a disability form. They also have some really excellent information. And um, if you're going to the hospital with someone, they have a lot of really good information and scripts that you might want to use. Um, I'll just give you a quick sample. And that is also one of the resources that Dana's if you, Dana, have you put it up already? Okay, thank you. Um, I have a developmental disability. This is not a health condition. You must not use it to make healthcare decisions about me. So there's some scripts that are available that you also might want to look at. Um, that, again, oh, here's the health, the passport that Dana's putting up right now. Thanks, Dana. Um, I think I'm going to, sorry. Um, so once, I guess the first, what I wanna make sure is that in your preparation, the most important thing to do is to think about all the things you would do if you were with the person and have that all available. Um, if you're in the ER with the person and you're being told that you have to leave, you might wanna check to find, to find out who the head nurse is, what unit are they gonna be on, who the shift people are at the facility. Um, if you can't do those things right at that time, then you want, these are things you wanna do once you get home and you start making phone calls after you have a list of all the things that you, you wanna do. Um, there's, let's see. So I, I think um, when you are told to leave, you want to make sure that you don't take no for an answer and you let them know that you're your per the person's voice and that you're, ask you're, you're saying that this isn't just an accommodation on the Americans with Disabilities Act, but this is really a life-saving need. Now, that all being said, you still may meet, find that you're being asked to leave. So I just, now I want to talk about after the person has been ad, admitted to the hospital and some of the things that you can do um, once you're there. People have been successful. Georgia Advocacy Office and the Citizen Advocacy Office has been trying to help people keep folks safe in the hospital for since we were over 40 years. It's what we do. Um, we generally tell people to stay, to be with the person 24-7. If you're not able to be with them 24-7, 
have a group of people who, you know, take shifts. Now, that all being said, some things haven't changed. You're still the protector. You're still the advocate. You still know what's best for that person. So now we need to just be more vigilant and more creative in the way that we advocate for the individual. Uh, you want to make sure you keep calling. Call, tell the facility, facility administrator, the risk manager, the social worker, um, the nurse administrator, call your state and local representatives, the governor's constituent services. Tell them that you're the person's voice. Explain to them why you need to have this. They're not, these are not, um, it won't fall on deaf ears. We do have one family I just spoke to recently and it did take them four days, but they actually have been able to stay with their loved one now and there's someone there 24 seven with the person but they continue to make those phone calls for four days. Um, there's advocacy tools, I think, um, that would also be helpful. I think that Dana's gonna put those up on the chat as well. Um, and you wanna um, think about a list of questions that you need answers to before you contact and talk to the nurse or the doctor. This is something I think that's really, really important and I hope that if you take nothing out of this, if you find yourself not with your loved one, start writing notes, start getting note taker, other, other people, friends, family, loved ones, coworkers of the individual and have them write notes and you just put a picture in with you with the loved one. Um, let them know, you know, just a couple of lines and the picture just identifying that person. That brings the person's reality. This is someone who's loved. It's someone who has people caring about them. This is a person who works. This is a daughter. It's a friend. It's a sister. So these are really, really important keeping that connection going while you're still fighting to try to get in to be with that person. Um, I hope this is making sense to you. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm seeing some head nods. Thank you. Um, you want to make sure that people who are supporting and, and caring for your loved one understands that this person who they are and they know who they are. So you want to make sure you have names on the um, back of the pictures, identifying the people um, so that they can have conversation with, especially if the person isn't someone who's generally uses words to communicate. Um, if they don't use words to communicate and they have it, it's still important to make sure you get those personal contacts. Some folks have been using, um, two-way electronic monitors. Um, a lot of the hospitals and the NICU units have uh, Wi-Fi baby monitors. And so one of the things that would be an excellent thing to insist on is that every single time the hospital calls you, whether it's the head nurse or the doctor to give you a status report, you're gonna wanna make sure you, you insist that they bring the phone to your loved one so that even if you can't have a two-way conversation, you can tell them, I love you. I'm so sorry you're sick. I wouldn't, you know, I would be with you if I could. I just want you to know that we're, you know, we're here and I'm trying to come see you. Just that, that it's soothing for them to hear your voice. You might want to play a little music. Um, you want to let the facility know what things calm your loved ones. Some of the things that you want to think about, um, what are their favorite music things? What kind of TV do they like? What calms them? Does it, do they like to have a warm blanket? Do they like to have a special thing to hold? Um, do they like someone just talking to them? So, so those are kinds of some of the things that I'm just, I can think about that maybe you're not, you might not think about at the time. I hope that this is helpful. I hope you never have to be in this situation. Um, 
So. Denise, think, thank you so much good. For, what, for what you shared. I think I think that I think this is awesome. Thank uh, you. You know, you were getting. I, I don't know if you were able to track the chat box, but you were getting lots of encouragers in the chat box in terms of how helpful the information was. So, really grateful. Thanks, for your Mark. Time. Are Are you willing to um, stay on until the end in case of people course. have specific questions? Of okay. course, and people Thanks. can call GAO at any time, and I'm happy to talk to them or my colleagues. You know, this is something we're really passionate about. Hope that came Thanks. through. Okay. Well, and I think it, I think it's I think it's really really important right now in a, in a in a new way. So thank you so much for highlighting the work that you guys have been doing for a long long time. So, um, so, um, just in terms of moving the um, conversation along, and thanks Denise for your time and and your willingness to stay on with us. But we do have Susan Goyko from Atlanta Legal Aid who uh, is on the call today. So we want to offer Susan an opportunity to, to talk about what Legal Aid is doing in the time of COVID to um, support people. Um, and so um, there's a, it looks like the website, the Legal Aid website is up. And Susan, are you on the call? And um, I am. To thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm, I'm really grateful for your time. So um, go ahead and um, let folks know what you're here to, to, to share with them. I will, thank you so much. And um, thanks to the DD Network for organizing this, these calls. Um, I like everybody here, I think we're, we're learning a lot during this time. And one of the most important things I'm learning is that building and maintaining community is so important. And these calls are really providing that. So thank you. I'm learning so much from all of you during these calls. So thanks for inviting me and thank you for hosting. Um, and I agree with Carmine. I really miss my workmates um, and my clients. Um, so just seeing friendly faces really boosts my spirit just to see you guys here. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, what I do. I'm a lawyer at the Disability Integration Project of Atlanta Legal Aid. Um, and I'm going to talk about what we do in normal times and what we're doing now during the pandemic. And I'm also going to uh, give a little overview of what the other lawyers in Atlanta Legal Aid do in case um, you need some other types of legal assistance. So the Disability Integration Project has um, one mission, and that is to enforce the Olmstead decision, which many of you probably are very familiar with. Um, but basically, it's the 1999 US Supreme Court case um, that uh, said that people with disabilities have a right to supports in the community um, under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Instead of, instead of having to go into institutions. Uh, so legal aid lawyers had the real honor to represent Lois Curtis and Elaine Wilson, the two plaintiffs in that case, um, who were trying to enforce their rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so here we are 20 years later and we are still working um, to enforce the civil rights of people with disabilities under Olmstead. So my little unit at Legal Aid, I call it a little unit because it's just me and two other lawyers um, and a couple of wonderful paralegals. Um, we represent folks with uh, disabilities and uh, families of children with disabilities. And we try to help people get all of the necessary supports and services in their own homes in the community so that they don't have to uh, go into institutions or um, we often work to help people get out of institutions and to get the appropriate supports. Uh, we represent people with all types of disabilities, so people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, people with psychiatric disabilities, people with physical disabilities, children's, children and adults. Um, so our areas of advocacy, um, 
typically and, and still now during this pandemic, we work uh, with people who are trying to obtain Medicaid waivers. So people who are denied the Medicaid waiver or if they're terminated or if their services are reduced, um, we help them appeal those denials. We do a lot of special education work, particularly for kids with real significant behavioral needs um, and children who are at risk of going into the GNET schools or kids who are in the GNET school and want to get out. Um, I have a real particular interest in um, people with disabilities who are in the criminal justice system. So we have a special project called the NIC project, which is a partnership with the DeKalb Public Defender's Office um, and uh, DBHED and local mental health providers. Um, and we try to help folks um, who are in the DeKalb County Jail, people with uh, mental illness and people with intellectual disabilities. We try to help them get connected to services and supports and housing so that they can get out. Um, so, and by the way, we've seen a real uptick in recent years of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities being arrested. So um, we recognize that Olmstead applies uh, in those situations because that's an institutional um, uh, place. And if people got the appropriate supports, oftentimes they could avoid uh, being arrested. Uh, we advocate for people uh, to have appropriate discharge planning when they do go into the hospital whether it's a state psychiatric hospital or a medical hospital. Uh, we're working with several children right now who are in out-of-state institutions, uh, trying to help them come back home to Georgia and to live in their own homes um, with their families with appropriate support. We advocate for children with disabilities who are trying to get appropriate services through Medicaid. Um, it's a special Medicaid service called EPSDT which stands for, and I'm probably going to get this wrong, early periodic screening, diagnostic, and testing, I think. Um, so we try to help kids get all the types of Medicaid services that they need, and we're working a lot with foster kids now, so children in the foster care system. Um, during this pandemic, we're doing all of that stuff for our current clients, but we're also um, looking out for some specific issues that may be um, related to the pandemic. So we're closely monitoring the um, Appendix K changes to the, the various Medicaid waivers. Um, for example, you know, they can, uh, individual service limits are waived, uh, family members can provide support. Um, we're really interested to find out if people who need their direct support professionals to come into the home. Is that still happening? Um, do the uh, direct support professionals have the appropriate PPE to feel safe and to safely provide support? Um, we're trying to find out how, because um, not everybody has Medicaid waivers, as we know from the poll, um, what about family supports? Are people able to access family supports? And what is that looking like for folks? Um, we're still getting a lot of calls from people who are in the state hospitals um, and, and jails. And so we want to make sure that people are able to get um, appropriate discharge planning um, from those types of institutions during this pandemic. And um, you know, in good times, it's always hard to find a, um, a provider often with through the, uh, the DD waiver. And so we're, we're looking out for that. And um, also there are now virtual ISP meetings, um, which can be challenging, but I know that support coordinators are working really hard right now. I was just on a call for about an hour with um, someone today. Um, so we're, we're working very closely with clients who are trying to um, make sure they're getting everything under their ISPs. Um, are people getting ser additional services, for example, if their condition is deter deteriorating or if they need extra support right now? Um, 
I want to mention a very important timeline or a deadline rather. Um, if you're an SSI recipient with a child under 17, you have until May 5th to go to the IRS website and provide the information in order to get your stimul stimulus check for the child. So the $500. So that's a May 5th deadline. So please um, make sure you go to the IRS website before May 5th, okay? Um, so real quickly, I know we're running out of time. If you um, know of, um, if you or you know somebody who needs some help, some legal service help um, obtaining community services, you can call, call our intake line, the Disability Integration Project intake line. Um, and this information will be on the Google Doc, uh, but it's 404-377-0707. Um, we can't take everybody on for representation, but we um, certainly can provide advice. Now, if you have a general legal problem, um, like for uh, unemployment or evictions or consumer issues, you can call our main legal aid number, um, and that's 404 524-5811. Um, we also have an, an online intake at atlantalegalaid.org. Um, and that's for the five metro counties I should, should mention. Uh, the Georgia Legal Services Program, which is our sister agency, serves the remainder of the state. Um, and you can go online um, at www.g lsp.org. Um, GeorgiaLegalAid.org, which is a website that we maintain, has some really great COVID resources, including some YouTube videos on things like food stamp changes, evictions, domestic violence, unemployment insurance, and things like that. So I encourage you to check out those resources and we'll make sure to put that on the, uh, the Google Drive. Um, and just to sort of end on this, this note, um, it's the 20th anniversary or last year was of Olmstead, um, and we're still fighting to, to enforce the decision and to make sure people's rights are, are being enforced. Um, and they still apply even during this pandemic, right? Um, so we're still fighting for people and alongside people with disabilities to get the services that they need. So thank you so much. Thank you, Susan, very much. Well, folks, we are, we are two minutes before time and I feel like we've had a wonderfully information packed session. I do wanna assure everyone that the planning team is committed still to capturing all of the questions that you send to us uh, via the COVID-19 email, which again is G-A-D-D-C-O-V-I-D-19 at gmail.com. And everything you've put in this chat window, we're capturing and tracking down answers. And next week's agenda will include uh, a, a bulk of time in which we can address questions we've been able to dig up answers to. Uh, as a closing, we would like to share with you a call to action, uh, recognizing that these are ever-changing times and that uh, Governor Kemp has begun to open up businesses uh, in Georgia, and we want for you to be able to share your uh, thoughts and experiences of that. So you'll see right there a number to call so that you can share uh, your thoughts about your experience of, of COVID-19. You can share uh, information about testing. Um, so we hope that you'll, you'll take on that advocacy opportunity and join us next week. Same time, Tuesday, three o'clock. It'll be May 5th. Uh, the link for registration remains the same. Uh, and I see mention here of a survey. Was there a final poll that you wanted to do, Susanna? 
No, um, we have the statewide survey that we have. And so we're going to put a link to that in the box, but everyone should be checking their emails and the emails that you received from the Georgia Council. There's a link. We're collecting data to share with um, policymakers and state agencies um, to help get people answers and get the support that they need. So important. So you will have gotten that link this morning. You'll get it again when we send out the summary information from today's meeting. Please distribute that far and wide. Uh, that, that kind of data pairs beautifully with the important stories we heard today and helps us uh, make the changes and advocate in the way that we need to. So we thank you all for being here. Take good care.